Hi, welcome to Unit 5, Understanding and Working with Young People. And we're at the House of Magic. And you can see over here, one side, you can see Houdini, who's the House of Magic. So the United Nations defines youth or young people as persons between the age of 15 and 24 years. And within that, of course, you've got early adolescents, middle adolescents and young adults within that group as well. The whole concept of youth or young people didn't exist before the 1940s and it's a product of television marketing and it became a separate culture. The term adolescence or youth is that transition time between childhood and adulthood when one does a lot of physical development, emotional maturing and the forming of one's identity. During this time for young people there is fast physical development, they're forming their identity, there's increasing independence and they're maturing emotionally. There's a restructuring of the brain too as they prepare for adulthood. Question one asks, a young person is defined as a transition between childhood and adulthood, what are some of the things that define this period of a person's life? It's useful to look at young people through the different generations because this helps us to see the changes, how young people are different in the different generations. The generation is all of the people born and living at the same time, and kind of regarded collectively or as a group. And it can also be described as the average period, generally of about 20, 25 or 30 years, during which children are born, grow up and become adults. And then of course begin to have children of their own. So we've got these generations, we've got the silent generation 1925 to 1942 and that was my father's generation, he was born in 1925, we've got the baby boomers 1940 to the early 1960s and that's my generation, then we've got the 1960s to the 1980s and that's generation Y, then we've got 1980s to 2000 which is generation X and that's the era of my children and then we have generation Z which is 2000s onwards. This Generation Z, early 2000s to the present day, and we all work with Generation Z. So what do we know about Generation Z? They're more positive about diversity. They're highly connected digitally. Many have both parents working, probably all. They may earn less than their parents. There's blurred gender roles. They've got this pluralistic diversity of religious and cultural beliefs and values. They've grown up with iPhones, the internet, they're the digital natives, they've had lifelong use of technology, the World Wide Web, text messaging, etc, etc. Um, they've got apps for everything. Question 2 asks, what are three characteristics of Generation Z? We also want to look at the developmental stages for young people. You've got the early childhood stage, 5 to 8 years, the middle childhood stage, 9 to 11 years, early adolescence, 12 to 14 years, and middle adolescence, 15 to 18 years. Question 3 asks, when looking at the developmental stages, what stage are the majority of your boarding students? Appendix 4, at the end of the notes, has got a table with the developmental stages and the characteristics of each stage and how we can respond to those stages. It's a useful table when working with young people, just knowing what's normal and what's expected sort of characteristics of young people at each of those stages. And question three says, this is the second part, it says read appendix four, the developmental stages, select three characteristics that you think are significant for boarding for one of the de developmental stages. And here's the chateau. Although every young person is unique and different, they all need to experience certain things. They need to experience positive self-concept, they need to experience success in what they attempt to do, they need to become increasingly independent, they need to develop and accept their own sexual identity, to give and receive attention, to experience adventure, and to be accepted by people of different ages, peers as well as those people who are in authority. We also need to keep in mind the two basic development principles. First one is this, age is not a perfect indicator of maturity. Most children go through a predictable order, but the ages at which they do this will vary enormously. An activity that's well within the capability of one young person may be much too difficult for another when they're exactly the same age. And providing choice of activities 
and providing multiple levels of difficulty within those activities is um, ideal in a boarding context. The second is the growth may proceed at different rates in various developmental areas within an individual child. So a child who is advanced physically may be average in terms of their mental ability and below average in terms of their emotional or social ability. Um, another child um, might be quite opposite to that. A child might need different experiences in each of these areas to reach his or her full potential. Let's have a look now at the adolescent brain. Children's brains have this massive growth spurt when they're very young, but by the time they're six, their brains are already 90 or 95% of an adult sized brain. Um, a few years ago, a neuroscientist, Dr. J. Geed, I think that's how you pronounce it, discovered that there was a time of significant growth and development inside the teenagers or the young person's brain in adolescence. The main change is that unused connections or neural pathways are pruned away and um, at the same time these connections or neural pathways that are used frequently these are strengthened or enhanced. This is a brain's way of becoming more efficient, the kind of use it or lose it principle. The brain's prefrontal cortex or the centre of reasoning um, and problem solving is the last to mature for young people and it's not fully developed until their early 20s. So adolescents rely heavily on that amygdala or the um, instinctual part of the brain which means that they react automatically, they re react um, without the ability to control their impulses and make sound decisions and so that can be problematic for young people and that's often getting them into trouble. So let's have a look at some statistics about young people worldwide. So this will give us a bit of a picture about young people across the world. About 85% of all young people live in developing countries, 85%. 60% of the world's young people live in Asia. Further 23% live in the developing regions of Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean. By 2025, the number of young people living in developing developing countries will grow to 89.5% or nearly 90%. At least 20% of adolescents will experience a mental health problem in a year. This is worldwide. Mostly, most commonly depression and anxiety. Um, question five asks us, when looking at world health population, what is a major issue for at least 20% of young people? In Australia, Young people comprise 20% of Australia's population, aged 20 to 24 years. In a group of 100 young people, 100 of Australia's young people, statistics will show that 66 live at home with two parents, a further 20 live with one parent, 3.6 are Indigenous, and 20 were born overseas, mostly in Asia or Europe. 20 speak a ling language other than English at home, an Asian language 10, or another European language 4. One young person, remember this is of the 100, one young person is homeless, 63 are engaged in some form of education, 43 in secondary school and 20 in tertiary education and 6 in vocational education. For non-Indigenous young people, 76% are enrolled in education, for Indigenous young people, only 50% are enrolled in education. This is a very significant difference or gap. Question six, part A asks, when looking at Australia's young people, what do you see as a concern in the area of education? Question six B asks, what do you see as a concern in the area of employment? And there are some concerns. Some regions or groups have high unemployment, Mobility in the youth labour market is high. The stability of full-time employment is declining. And then there's COVID-19. And the restrictions that the different states around Australia put in place in response to COVID-19, that particularly affected jobs for young people. And so this figure of 11.5% out of work, we will see that increase significantly in 2020 because of the impact of COVID-19. Let's have a look at religion. 
Um, and out of 100 young people in Australia, 66 said they have a religious affiliation. And of those, 58 said they're Christian. And the next largest group was Islam. 23 said they had no religion at all. And the remaining 13 didn't specify any religion. And then let's look at health. In Australia, out of 100 young people, five are overweight or obese, and Indigenous people are more likely to be overweight or obese. 26 have a mental disorder in a given year, and this is a really significant problem that we must address. 9.25% are current daily smokers, 16 males drink at risky levels, 10.5 females drink at risky levels, um, suicide is the leading cause of death for young people. 20% of 16-year-olds had used illicit drugs. Question 7 asks, when looking at the burden of disease, what is the number one contributing condition for both males and females? Um, burden of disease is like the cost to the community, not just uh, dollars, but also in the social cost to the community, you know, um, not having people available to work and all that sort of thing because they have this disease. And so you can see the options there. And um, I'm wondering what you think is the main burden of disease, which is highest out of all of these, alcohol dependence, migraine, suicide, personality disorders, anxiety and depression, road traffic accidents, schizophrenia, um, heroin and, or poly drug dependency, cannabis dependency, bipolar disorder. So what are you thinking for males and females? For males, it's anxiety and depression, followed by road traffic accidents, schizophrenia. For females, it's the same, anxiety and depression, um, and then followed by asthma, migraine, etc. Um, and so that's interesting, isn't it? And both for males and females, it's anxiety and depression. And so again, that's something as a society we will need to address. We want to look at the relationship between Australian young people and social media. Question eight asks, the relationship between Australian young people and social media, you know, what is it? Describe it in your own words. You could use these sort of things, very strong use of social media. Some people say they are obsessed by social media. They're dependent on it. They're very attached to it. Um, they are involved or active in social media, but um, it's definitely a big part of the lives of Australian young people. This graph here shows the use of social networking sites in Australia. Um, by age, you know, by age group, and you can see that um, you've got 94% of uh, young people are using social media, down to 61% of people who are 55 years or older. This is a um, interesting table here because it shows uh, the difference between Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Pinterest, and the blue line is Facebook, the red line is YouTube, orange is Instagram, etc. And you can see that for young people, for Generation Z, um, YouTube is more important than Facebook. But for all the other generations, Facebook comes first. And you can see that um, YouTube declines as people get older. So uh, for the pre-boomers or for the baby boomers, um, Facebook comes first and then you've got YouTube. Social media in 2019, the most popular online activity um, is social networking. And so it's used by 90, 91%. Um, you've got Facebook, which has got that strong user base across all five generations. Um, then you've got YouTube, which is a leading online community for Generation Z. Um, Instagram and Pinterest have grown the fastest. Pinterest, a third of Generation Z use it, as well as the other generations. Instagram, over two thirds of Generation, 68% Generation Z, um, and the majority of Generation Y uh, use Instagram. Why do they use social media? Why do teens use it? Um, for talking to friends, joining in on group discussions, learning about current events, just staying up to date, meeting new people. Sometimes it's just about um, not having anything to do or feeling bored, feeling like they're going to miss out, that fear of missing out. Um, that's some of the reasons why young people use social media uh, to the extent that they do. These are the platforms that teens are using. 
So you can see there for messaging apps, um, WhatsApp, uh, Kick, WeChat, Bybar, GroupMe, Joff, Tango, Jot, Tango. Um, texting via SMS is out of fashion, although um, people my age still do it and still rely on it. You've got photo sharing platforms such as Snapchat and Instagram, confession and feedback platforms, those ones there, uh, streaming and video apps, you can see those, apps to meet new friends, and then online games and game streaming platforms, and you can see those ones there, and Fortnite of course has been very big lately. When you look at the 10 most popular things for teens to do in 2019, um, YouTube came in at 53%, then Instagram, Snapchat, Netflix, 28%, Spotify, 11%, Hulu, 5%, etc. Social media is changing youth culture. It uh, tends to make young people more apathetic, you know, less interested in things like politics. It can desensitize them, disconnect them from reality, and fosters that fascination with, um, you know, a, a violence uh, that's gone viral. But um, it also helps young people find a voice and a platform for advocating for social change. So the way that they uh, interact with politics has changed um, and they can do that online and it gives them a voice and a platform for doing that. Um, the rise of influencers, uh, it's given a space for young people to do that and uh, many young people uh, are making a living from that. It's significantly disrupting the retail clothing industry. You've got that selfie era giving rise to the wear it once type culture. So what are the risks? Um, spending too much time online and being disconnected from the real world, being the victim of online bullying, damaging your online reputation, having your personal information shared, being harassed or annoyed by someone you do not want attention from, being the victim of a scam, and then having reduced self-esteem for some teenagers. This is a pretty interesting quote. It's from the um, Office of the eSafety Commission, and that eSafety Commissioner, or that eSafety site, uh, is really well worth looking at. There's a lot of very good information on there. Um, and they say this, every single social networking app has the ability to be used for cyberbullying. Sadly, any app or platform that's popular with children and teenagers can attract people with sinister intentions or predatory behavior, particularly when the games or apps include features such as video streaming, pairing with strangers or anonymous feedback. And you see down the bottom there, it says, agreeing to the terms of use of a social media platform such as Facebook or Instagram, which you must do uh, to join, means giving that platform permission to use anything you post in a variety of different ways. Social media has been linked to higher levels of loneliness, envy, anxiety and depression. And you can see that uh, slide a few slides back about the health of young people, how anxiety and depression is uh, such a big issue and it's such a big burden of disease on Australia. Narcissism and uh, decreased social skills. Um, part, this is partly due to the psychological effects of having one's everyday affairs publicly judged by, you know, many people, sometimes even hundreds or thousands. How to know if something is wrong? If you know, if you notice big changes in the energy levels of young people or their in their enthusiasm for on offline life, then there's probably something wrong. Um, just their engagement in normal conversation, the amount of time they spend doing other things like sport, homework, hobbies, etc., and their self-esteem and their sense of worth. So it's good just to keep an eye on these sort of things and to particularly in boarding, to try and understand or be sensitive to these things um, to see if something is going wrong. Australian young people and crime. Approximately 12,000 young people are under Australian juvenile justice supervision. That's across Australia. And 650 are in detention centres, so in a kind of prison. And so that's right across Australia. That's a very low number, particularly when you divide that amongst the states and territories in Australia. You'll see that there's quite a low number in detention centres. And so the Australian justice system prefers to use 
supervision orders, that sort of thing, rather than putting young people in jail. Young people commit 22% of all the offences, but they are only 14% of the population. And so um, there's an imbalance there between uh, young people and older people. We want to have a look at youth culture. Um, youth culture in Australia is very diverse and it looks very different depending on who is describing it. So if it's a young person describing it, um, they're probably enthusiastic and uh, they see a lot of good things happening in youth culture. Um, if you have a perspective from an older person, they might be looking at it a lot more negatively. Youth culture is very complex. It's continually evolving and we need to keep up and understand the trends. So youth culture and residential supervisors, it's um, we should understand contemporary youth culture uh, because it is complex and continually evolving. And you can see there's, there's an article there, um, kids shattered by their social media use. And so we should be looking out for these sort of articles. We should be, um, you know, signing up to things like Generation Next so that we can get information all the time, get genera information regularly, uh, because we need to stay on top of it. When we talk about youth culture, we're talking about the way young people conduct their lives, and it includes their interests, their styles, behaviours, music, beliefs, vocabulary, clothing, sports, dating, all of that sort of thing. Young residential supervisors may be close to the age of the students, and you know they, of course, need to watch the boundary gap, but they also will be familiar, or more familiar, with um, current youth culture. Older residential supervisors need to understand and try and bridge that age culture gap. We all need to stay in touch with current youth culture. And why is that? Um, it is to have empathy and connection with young people. It's about duty of care, being more alert to the issues, and it's about being able to support young people better. And that's question nine, which asks, why is it important for boarding supervisors to have some understanding of current youth culture? With any youth culture, you'll also have subcultures, um, and this is like a social group with patterns of behaviour that distinguish it from others in that culture. And you can see some there, cyber, hipster, goth, thug, emo, preppy, those sort of things. Um, youth subcultures are different from the general youth culture. Um, their norms, values, behaviours vary very, very widely. They're constantly changing, and this is an avenue of self-expression. And some of these subcultures can be hostile to the dominant culture. So we call those um, countercultures. Subcultures are distinguished by fashion, beliefs, slang, behaviours, vehicles, music genres, socioeconomic class, um, gender, intelligence, ethnic background, all of those sort of things. Um, and some of them include these. Um, Emo, super geek, jock dolly, gangster, punk light, glamazon, hipster, techno boho and techno bobo, the lads, surfy, skaters, hall girls, sea punks, gym, bro, um, gym bros and that sort of thing. And, and this list uh, are supposed to be the main subcultures in Australian cities. Um, in 2014, the only real teenage cults visible to an outsider displaying their allegiances by manner of dress seem to be metalheads and emos. Um, it's this, so this is not necessarily happening on street corners anymore, but it's certainly happening online. E.g. Molly Soda inspired Tumblr girl look or Helena and the Hall girls, that sort of thing. Um, and the Hall girls, of course, is a subculture by itself. Trendera founder Jane Buckingham urges entrepreneurs to prepare for the future by looking at what the youngest generation wants right now. Forecast what's next through deep research and, and consumer surveys on every, anything from um, technology to gender fluidity. So does boarding need to follow and learn from that? Probably does. So question 10 asks us about our approach to young people in subcultures and it says 
if a student became involved in a subculture such as emo, what approach should the supervisor take? So what would you do if a young person got involved in a culture like that, subculture? And this is what you would do. You would take an interest, ask, hear their story, get them to explain it. Um, and hopefully you would research it a little bit so that you had a bit of background information so you understood what the subculture was about. I think secondly, we need to respect a young person's right to individuality. Um, and we need to also understand and respect that this is a choice they've made. It's something that's important to them. So we need to respect that. But we must intervene if their choices are harmful to themselves or other people or if they break the boarding school rules or the boarding house rules. Question 11 asks, how would you describe youth-centered practices? And youth-centered practices where young people are the main focus, it's where you have activities that engage and provide opportunities for young people, and it's where young people are empowered. Question 12 says that there are 13 youth-centered practices listed. List below the three that you see as most important. And you can see the list here. Um, understand the factors that influence young people sensitive to the special needs, respect identities, culture and diversity, understand the developmental issues, be informed about issues and interests, be aware of rights and responsibilities, include young people in decision making. That's kind of empowering young people, isn't it? Um, which is the next one, confidentiality and duty of care, observe boundaries in your role, um, comfortable user-friendly environment, and use sensitive, innovative approaches to dealing with issues. So you need to find three of those. And I know that, see that number 10, observe boundaries in your role. I know that I would be putting that one in there. Um, and I also like number eight, empowering young people. But you look through there and see the three that you think are most important. Then we have um, this section on effective interaction with young people. And this is interaction that is caring and positive, interaction that is non-judgmental, that is fair and inclusive, and with rapport like a genuine interest in the young people, connecting uh, with young people and really listening to young people. And question 13 asks, there are four suggestions for understanding and connecting with young people. Which two of these do you think are most important? So you've got to choose two of those. We want to look at listening to young people, just talk about listening to young people. Our journey um, our own personal journey affects how well we listen and our reactions to what we hear. So our own values, opinions, biases, weaknesses, strengths, all of that affects how we listen to young people. And it's very important that we can uh, reflect on that and understand that um, so that we can listen to young people and um, also understand how that affects how we listen. Question 14 says, explain why we need to self-reflect as we listen to young people. And as we self-reflect, it helps us understand who we are. And um, it also helps us understand how that affects us. You know, that bias, that strength, all of those things, our beliefs, our values, how that affects us. And it also helps us to stay impartial and non-judgmental. If we look at listening strategies, we'll see that there's four here, appreciative listening, you know, and that's listening to things like um, plays and that sort of thing, um, critical listening, um, empathetic listening, and discriminative listening. And the most important of those in our role is empathetic listening, um, listening with empathy. And so that's about, um, you know, just giving them full attention, playing, paying attention to their emotions, um, really hearing and understanding young people, um, walk in their experiences, and um, just trying to improve understanding and trust. And question 
15 asks, what is empathetic listening or listening with empathy? And you could put some of those down for that. When we look at effective listening, we can see that these strategies here help us with effective listening. So that is um, give undivided attention, you know, not looking at your phone or something else uh, while you're listening to them, but just giving a young person undivided attention. Be non-judgmental. Um, you know, they don't always need an instant reply. So, you know, being quiet sometimes is good. Respond to a young person's emotions. Assure them that you understand. Um, and sometimes you have to ask them to clarify something. Be approachable. You know, be an approachable sort of person. And, um, you know, what goes along with that, of course, is also having time. You know, uh, having time where you can uh, go and talk to young people, not being so busy uh, that you don't have time to talk to and engage with young people, to listen to young people. And number seven here is don't overreact. And question 16 says there are six suggestions for effective listening. Which three of these do you consider most important? So just looking at those, um, which three do you think are most important? Um, if we're looking at effective communication with young people, we need to make sure that we have clear, consistent messages, that we are positive, that we don't just continually criticise, so that um, the only times that we're talking to them are when we're pulling them up on their behaviour or when we're being critical about something. Avoiding power struggles. Use things like the media to bring up topics um, and focus on their interests you know, what is important to them. Avoid talking too much. Young people prefer face-to-face -to -face communication um, or tech-based, that, you know, they, they're not big on written. Um, communicate at their level. Um, this backdoor approach, what, what this means is sometimes you might, might find it difficult to communicate uh, with a young person, but you could do that through another student, um, that sort of thing. And giving notice, you know, giving students um, a good notice about things. And I, I remember um, when I was in boarding and, you know, you might be talking to the students about what you're going to do next Saturday. And if you gave them plenty of notice, um, they would uh, engage with that and get on board with that and, um, you know, take up those sort of activities. But if you told them on the Saturday morning, um, you know, we're going to town today or we're going fishing or whatever, then um, they'd say, whoa, no, we don't want to do that. So giving them notice is really important. This next question asks about um, communication to build trust. What, what are two ways that your communication strategies could help you build trust? Um, and it's things like this, keeping confidentiality. Um, now, you, you can't keep things confidential if, they are, if it's a mandatory reporting issue, or if it's a um, issue, some sort of issue uh, where a child could be harmed or harm could happen to a child. Um, so, for example, if they came to you and said they had an STI and it wasn't being treated, you can't just keep that um, confidential. They have to get treatment for that. Um, and um, there, so there will be things that we can't keep confidential. Um, but with most of the things that they say to us, we can keep confidentiality. Keep your word, never lie to a young person. Admit your mistakes, and sometimes we have to do this and apologise. Um, share experiences in, in a limited way. And so what we mean by that is um, uh, they might be saying something to you and you, you might say, oh, well, yes, that happened to me when I was a young person and this is how I dealt with it. You know, so uh, we have to be careful around sharing experiences, but, you know, just sharing in a limited way. This next section is about rapport. And this is a uh, very important part um, of a boarding supervisor's role, being able to have rapport with the students, being able to engage or connect with the students. So rapport is that friendly connection, you know, just having that common ground. Um, and indicators of rapport are not being harsh, not being on their case all the time, making sure that we keep that professional gap that we talked about in Unit 2, not being over-familiar or letting students be over-familiar, 
having gentle but firm boundaries and having that mutual respect. I think that mutual respect where you respect the students and you expect from them the same sort of respect back. When we talk about uh, rapport, um, oh, and we've got question 18 there, of course, and um, question 18 says, um, what are four indicators of a good balance with rapport? And you can see that you can see those four indicators there. So with with rapport, it's really important to have a balance, um, and that that balance is between being distant and uncaring, or being over familiar. So you know we don't want to be cold, aloof, distant, and uncaring. So that's down one end, but up the other end. It's just being too over-friendly, too over-familiar um, with students. And so if you are over-familiar, what can happen? And this is question 19. Um, if you are over-familiar, it, it can uh, cause young people to lose respect. It can cause them to not follow instructions, to take liberties. Um, they might make accusations. It could be rumours. This can often look like grooming. Uh, this, you know, very familiar sort of um, behaviour or talk or conversation with young people. And it often can look like favouritism as well, where um, a young person um, will expect special treatment because of the way that you've been over familiar. So we need to be very careful that we are not aloof and distant, but also that we are not over familiar, that we do keep that professional gap that we talked about before. Sometimes you're going to have to restore the balance with rapport. And we have had boarding supervisors come to us and say, look, I think I've been a bit over familiar. What do I do? And so what you do is to reinforce that professional distance between you and the student. And for a while, that might even be, you might even be more distant than is ideal until that balance is restored. We need to make sure that the students realise it's not their fault, we're not punishing them. You might talk to them and say something like, look, I think I've been a bit too free and easy, I need to make some changes. Um, and that's how you restore the balance with rapport. Let's have a look at cross-cultural young people. People from a cross-cultural context or from another culture might experience language barriers. There might be expectations in your boarding residence that are hard for them to understand. They may experience discrimination. There might be past traumas, dislocation, disconnection that affect the way that they um, behave or the way that they operate in your boarding residence. And sometimes this can seem like um, they're not cooperating, you know, their behaviour is poor, they're not engaging, when really this is just a result of traumas, past traumas. They can have negative economic and health outcomes and they can have poor access to health services. So how do we support these young people, culturally and linguistically diverse young people or young people from another cultural context? This is question 20. The first thing is value the diversity that they bring to your boarding residence. They bring diversity in lots of different ways to your boarding residents and we need to value that. Use cross-cultural brokers. And so this might be a person from their culture um, or it could even be an Australian um, who is familiar with their culture, familiar with their language and can bridge that gap and be a cross-cultural broker. Get awareness training. So make sure that um, you're informed and aware and you understand as much as you can about their culture. Deal with discrimination. Uh, discrimination shouldn't happen, but some, sometimes it does. And when it does, we need to deal with it straight away. If you've got students who are discriminating against other students on the basis of their culture, their language, whatever, deal with it straight away and resolve it as quickly as you can. Question 21 asks you to research YouTube to find a clip that's interesting and relevant to your students that you could use in, the, in, in your residence to promote uh, respect for other cultures and uh, these are the sort of clips that are good to p play to students to get them thinking about um, other cultures, how they can value people from other cultures um, and how they can work with people from other cultures and so there's lots of YouTube clips um, and you can see some of them here playing for change songs around the world, don't worry be happy stand by me, what kind of Asian are you? Um, there's uh, this one here, celebrating cultural diversity in football. Um, there it is there. 
and um, I'll see a little bit of well, that. Um, but on it's a uh, comes it's the a time. it's a great clip, and um, uh, it gets students talking me, and thinking about like cross-cultural issues, playing for change, um, and this. Clip here, what kind of Asian are you? And this is actually embarrassing to watch because I think sometimes we do these things without thinking. And um, so these are all worth there. watching and they're worth right. um, nice day, showing huh? to your yeah, students finally, right? to help them understand your other English cultures, to help them um, begin to think there. about how to interact oh, and value not. people <clears throat> from Where other cultures. Where are you? Okay. Let's talk about intervention. Intervention is when we intentionally take an action uh, to resolve some sort of situation that's occurred. So when must we intervene? We must intervene for risk-taking behaviour, self-harm, suicidal thinking, um, that sort of thing, disrespect, bullying, and breaking the rules of the residence, breaching the rules of the residence. For those sort of things, we must intervene in those student student behaviours. The purpose of the intervention, this is question 22, the purpose of the intervention should always be for the safety and care of the students, to ensure the safety and care of the students, to change behaviours or attitudes, and to ensure positive outcomes for students. So that's intervention. We're going to talk now about a community development approach to boarding. What is community? Community is a group of two or more people connected by a common interest or a common theme or a common identity, something like that. And this is question 23a. Um, boarding is a community. Um, and also boarding is part of a larger community all around it. And then within boarding, you're going to have lots and lots of other little communities. So um, you, you might have um, the, you know, the football students or the horse riding students or the, you know, all these little communities within your community. And, um, and of, course, of course, your boarding program is part of a larger community. So what is community development? And this is question 23b. Um, and the three parts to it really, in, in, this is in its most simple form. So it's communities working together to identify needs and opportunities, plan, organize and take action, evaluate the effectiveness of the action and the impact of the action. Um, and then you may, you know, change the, what you're doing, change, uh, you know, your program or plan or whatever. So that's question 23b. There are certain values in community development and they're values like social justice, self-determination, working and learning together, sustainable communities, participation, reflective practice, those sort of values. And um, this is question 24. And if you look at question 24, what it's asking you to do is to match the value with the actual description of the value or the way the value is defined. So let's just have a quick look at those values. Social justice, this is respecting and valuing diversity, challenging oppression and discrimination, addressing power imbalances such as bullying, protecting rights to make a complaint or just protecting rights per se, principles that empower young people, equality, solidarity, that sort of thing. That's social justice. Self-determination, this is valuing concerns that students raise, raising awareness of the range of choices open to students, promoting future plans, setting their own goals, building self-control for the students. Um, for, and, and that's what we call self-determination. Working and learning together, doing duties together, um, just uh, knowing and um, valuing collective action as being effective, contributing to the community, being involved in decision making, considering all perspectives and sharing good practice to learn from each other. Sustainability is empowering all people, developing skills to take action, reviewing feedback, learn from, learning from our experience, making changes where we need to, using resources with respect to the environment, recycling, not wasting water, power, etc. And it's also sustaining the residences. So 
um, ensuring that boarding can continue. And so for boarding to continue, you must have um, students, you must have qualified um, staff, you must have uh, good processes in place for boarding to be sustainable. Participation. This is promoting the participation of marginalised excluded people, identifying barriers to participation, challenging those barriers, developing choices for everybody, sharing good practice, learning from each other. And then the last of these is reflective practice. So learning by thinking back on our own practice, providing opportunities for feedback, then changing our practice in response to that reflection, um, valuing a complaints process so that empowers students again, and just keeping others informed and updated. But in its simplest form, reflective practice is just thinking and looking back on our practice, um, changing our practice if it needs to be changed based on our reflection. So a community development approach in boarding, this is where students are encouraged to be proactive. It means listening to students, letting them contribute. It's a culture of trust and respect. It's where students are more self-determining. It's where students are engaged and empowered. It's where students grow in capacity and skills to be more active citizens. And the assessment here, question 25, it says, using a community development approach in boarding will result in, and you either have to write correct or incorrect next to those. And so um, if you look at that third one down there, students being in charge of the boarding residence, is that a community development process? No, that's incorrect. No requirements for consequences in the residence? That's incorrect. So I think you get the idea with this question 25. Um, community development has work models, and these are social action work models, advocacy work models, local development work, brokering connections, community needs analysis and research. And there's some examples of this. A social action work model might be Clean Up Australia or Collecting for the Red Cross, Helping at the Local Pet Shelter, World Vision, 40-Hour Famine, those sort of things. Advocacy might be the student council speaking up on behalf of um, other students, that, that sort of thing. Local uh, development work, it, it could be where students develop their own gym area, where they build a garden, um, where they make a guest lounge or fit out a guest lounge, that's locality development work. Brokering connections is staff helping new students connect with a sports club or a part-time job or with their school teachers, um, that, that is brokering connections. So they are community development work models. We're going to look now at the origins of community development. Um, in, and the images here are from the Rift Valley Ac Academy uh, in the Rift Valley in Kenya. Um, it's a very old boarding school in Kenya. So the origins of community development, we first started off with a charity approach and, and this focused on communities of poverty. A person outside the community came along and identified the need and then resources were provided to meet that need. And so that's what we call a charity approach. But it's problematic. And this is question 26 is about this. You know, why is it problematic? It's problematic because it disempowers the community. It does not address the inequality. Communities became dependent on externals. And the external expert doesn't always know the real problems. So if we look at these evolving models of community development, we started off with that charity model, and then we look at a needs-based model, a gap-based model, asset-based model, and then a rights-based model. So charity was first, and then needs. And so let's have a look at needs. Um, a needs-based model, and this is the question 27A addresses this. Um, this is where the community itself identifies the need and then they seek resources to address the need. They talk between donors in the community, but it stops short of addressing policies and regulations that could make a full change. So um, this is better because the community itself identifies the need, but it still doesn't address you know, those underlying uh, reasons why the community is like this. 
There's a gap-based model, and this is 27B. This focuses on the gap between where they are now and where they want to be, and um, we have closing the gap in Australia with Indigenous um, education, mortality, and lots of things like that, and it's all about closing the gap between Indigenous outcomes and outcomes for other Australians. So this focuses on the gap. It helps communities with goal setting and planning. The downside of this, this is a this is a good way of um, dealing with needs and issues, but the downside is that it can lead to a problem-focused perspective of community. So you're just always looking at problems. And then we have asset-based community development, and this is still the Rift Valley Academy that you're looking at in the pictures. Um, so asset-based community development looks within the community to find existing resources, things that are already there. And so that might be um, people resources, it might be funding, it might be materials such as building materials or whatever, but you look within the community first to find those existing resources. You're looking at what is strong and positive in the community, what are the resources that the community has, and then you can use those resources, the community's own assets and resources as the basis for development. And this is fairly recent, this approach, and began in the 1990s, you know, some 25, 30 years ago. And then we have the rights-based model and um, 27D, question 27D addresses this rights-based model. So a rights-based model asks what human rights are being denied here? Um, uh, and it addresses inequality and disadvantages and power structures may need to be challenged um, to address these human rights. So that's the history of uh, the way we've approached community development, um, all the way from the charity model, all the way through to the rights-based model. Now we're going to look at private and public issues. Um, so a range of issues affect students, um, and you know we need to respect confidentiality, recognise when something is private, and just be you know careful around that. Uh, this question here. Um, asks, we, you know, we keep information um, private unless what, you know, and, and, you know, what reasons are there for not keeping information private? So that is question 28. Um, and if it's a mandatory reporting issue, you can't keep it private, the disclosure of abuse or whatever. If a young person is thinking of harm to themselves or to others, you can't keep that private. If it's an illegal activity, or if it's a serious medical condition that's going to harm the student, you can't keep that private. But other issues we need to keep private. We can take a private issue and make it into a public issue. Um, and this is question 29A. Why would a boarding supervisor do this? Well, um, you do it because it might affect others as well. And so one of the examples in the notes is a... Uh, a young girl who comes to the boarding supervisor and says that, you know, she feels like she's very unfit, she um, doesn't get an opportunity to exercise, um, she's eating out of the chip machine that's in the foyer, you know, that you put coins in, and, um, uh, and the boarding supervisor says, look, well, this might affect more people than just you. What if we talk to others about it as well? And the student might, might agree, um, and... If they do agree, then you can use that process to help not just this one student, but it might help quite a few students. And so this is the process. This is 29B. Firstly, you listen with empathy. You know, just uh, you elicit their story. You know, draw out their story. You explain that it might affect others. You ask their permission to take it to the whole group. And then if they agree to that, then you consult and you know, work out how you're going to do it. Are we going to do this by putting up a poster? Are we going to have a group session? Are we going to have a dinner announcement? How will we do this? Um, and then assist the young person to take action. Empower them to do it. Don't do it all yourself. Don't do things that they can do. And then help them to reflect. Is this working? So you might, um, you know, with, with that uh, young girl, for example, 
um, and a program to help her and other people in her situation. You might have a gym class or a, a walking class or whatever in the mornings. Um, you might actually remove the chip machine or put healthy food in there, uh, those sort of things. When we talk about eliciting their story, the steps to this, uh, you develop rapport with the young person. You would use the questions very carefully. You would encourage them and support them as they tell their story. Sometimes you'd need to guide or direct them. It's about eliciting or drawing the story out. It's not just a matter of sitting there and passively as they tell the story, you are working with them to draw that story out. Um, and you know, sometimes you'll guide the student or direct the student. And in the end, um, you're going to provide some sort of direction or a next step. So just going back here for a moment, when we look at pub private to public process, this process, if you say to the student, look, I'd like to share this with, or I'd like you to share this with other students because, you know, uh, this may help other students. What do you do if the student says, whoa, no, I don't want to do that. You know, I don't, they'll think bad thoughts about me or whatever. Um, I don't want to do that. Um, and that's fine. You've got to just uh, say to the student, that's fine. Um, uh, but then you can work with that individual student to make an individual action plan and then um, hold them accountable to the plan so that they can uh, develop and improve and resolve these issues. So that's what you do if somebody says, no, I don't want to be a part of that process. All right, so let's go on to this section about power imbalance. So what is a power imbalance? Um, this is when one person has more power than another and it can significantly affect their lives. And so uh, this is question 30A. So obviously a boarding supervisor has more power than a boarding student. You know, there is a power imbalance there. Um, and sometimes you will have, um, well, frequently really, power imbalances in the dorm or in the group of students in boarding, you know, where you might have a student who um, is taller or bigger or stronger, um, who enjoys more popularity, um, who has more status. It can come up through age or gender or length of time in the group, but there can be these power imbalances. So what do we do about power imbalances? How do we deal with a power imbalance? And this is question 30B. Um, firstly, we recognize the power imbalance. So we say, okay, there's a power imbalance there. We understand why. Um, we can discuss the effects of it and try and understand the effects of this power imbalance. Um, and then we use the power appropriately or we work with the students to use power appropriately so that they do not misuse power. Um, and then we monitor. So recognize it, understand it, discuss the effects of it, use it appropriately, and then monitor. We're going to look now at reflecting on our own practice. Um, reflecting, reflective practice is this capacity to think back on our actions, to come to a conclusion, and to change my practice if needed. And this is question 31a. Um, and you know, I think of things like um, you might have had an altercation in the boarding residence last night um, and you had to deal with that altercation. And so afterwards you might think about that. And some people actually journal this. So they uh, journal it. Um, they think back on their actions, the actions that they took uh, during that altercation, the actions they took to resolve the altercation, and they'd come to a conclusion. They might think, well, I think I would do that differently next time. Or you might even think, um, I think I did that really well and I'll do exactly the same thing next time. But you come to a conclusion and then you change your practice if you do need to change it. Um, sometimes we have bias, you know, we've all got backgrounds, opinions, values, etc. Sometimes this can negatively affect our conduct or our reactions or our reflection. Um, and how can you know that? Um, and there's different ways you can know it. And this is question 31B. Um, you can see it from other people's reactions. So if somebody reacts, um, if somebody complains, 
um, you know, we can we can see that uh, from that those sort of reactions. You can ask for feedback. So you can ask for feedback from your peers, from a mentor, from your head of boarding. Um, you can um, have an appraisal process. So this could be a fairly formal appraisal process, or you could check, you know, back or self-reflect, uh, checking back against the code of conduct, that sort of thing. So that's how you know if your practice has been affected by your values, your bias, whatever. Question 36 is a self-awareness questionnaire. So if you have a look at that, you can see, um, you know, it's got here one, never, two, rarely, and so on. And you just put one, two, three, or four down the side of it. Um, and the purpose of this self-awareness questionnaire is for us to see that you are capable of looking at your own practice um, and uh, making decisions or um, understanding where, where your practice is good or where it needs to change or where it needs to improve, that sort of thing. Um, and there's a couple of questions at the end, so that you can do those as well. And so that's the end of Boarding Fundamentals BF5. Thank you very much.